Welcome to Accelerate Your Wealth, a podcast by Rebecca Robertson, founder and director of Evolution Financial Planning. This series, we're focusing on female financial independence, looking towards a stronger financial future. Be sure to let us know your thoughts on the show, and please do connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or Instagram, or head over to www.rebeccarobertson.co.uk. So just in a moment, we're going to be talking to Shane Blankman. Um, So Shane joined the team at U Asset Management in its inception when it was called Both for Investments in 2012 and is now the Chief Investment Officer. Um, He's responsible for communicating investment strategy to all stakeholders as well as overall responsibility for the investment team. Um, Having joined Friends Provident in 1990, Shane had various roles within the industry before focusing purely on investments. And in 2004, Shane co-funded Equip Solutions, which is a genesis of you and has been managing our flagship, their flagship uh, in active models since then. Active models means an investment portfolio. Shane is a chartered fellow of, um, of the Chartered Institute of Securities and Investment and a member of the CFA UK Society. Today, Shane and I are going to be talking about um, timing the markets, um, how to start investing and avoiding temptation for better long term investing. I hope you enjoy it and I'd love to hear what your thoughts are on today's show. Enjoy. How are you doing? You, how are you doing, Shane? You good? Very well, thank you, Rebecca. Very well. Good. Yes. Apart it's, from it's a tickly nice. cough and, and having this ongoing cough. Yes. Yeah. It's uh, so apologies to anyone if I end up coughing in their ears. It's uh, it's not deliberate, but yeah, it's quite nice to see the sunshine out as well. Oh, it's amazing at the moment. I think everyone can be sympathise with a, a, a snotty nose or a cough or um, at the moment. I think we've all had something or other over the last few months since we've come out of lockdown and uh, started socialising more. Yes, it's the sort of uh, trade off, isn't it, really? And thankfully, mine wasn't COVID related, which is which is amazing. But yeah, it's normal colds and coughs and splutters sort of uh, coming yeah. to the fore now. Definitely. Well, so I've known you a few years now and my greatest and uh, fondest memory is where you were ever so kind, where you let my daughter, Emily, um, interview you um, and ask you some questions. And I looked at that video the other day because I'm looking at reuniting my um, my YouTube channel. And um, she just looks so tiny and so dizzy <laughs> compared to where she is now. Like they, they, they just grow so quickly. And I think you've got two girls. Is that right? A uh, boy and a girl. Yeah. Boy and a now, girl. Um, 16 and nearly 14. Yeah. Gosh, it's another world having a teenage. Daughter, it is. Isn't it? it is. It, uh, yeah, it goes incredibly quickly as well, but brings you another set of challenges and opportunities. Yes. Yeah. Yes, of definitely uh, learning of uh, how to deal with yes. <laughs> teenagers. Yeah. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts just on that for a second. So a lot of us are parents, a lot of us are striving to, you know, hand over either a legacy of some kind to our children, um, whether it's paying for university or um, giving them a lump sum to buy a house or um, it might be, you know, allow them to get their first car and giving that sort of a bit of a helping hand. And I speak to clients about that in the context of investing and possibly having a junior ISA where that can grow over time. Yeah. Is that, I mean, you're, you know, you're a chartered uh, fellow in the Chartered Institute, Institute of Securities and Investments and a member of the CFA UK Society. So just given a little bit of your bio. There, <laughs> Thank you. Is, is that something that you always knew that you were going to do for your kids before you had them? Or is it something you did? Oh, bugger, I better do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was it was um, definitely something to, to have in mind for them. Um, I, I was lucky enough when Toby and Jessica were born that uh, the government were giving out their two hundred and fifty pounds yeah. vouchers. Yeah, it was a very slim window. I do remember that, and it's it's a great example to them about uh, long term investing and mm. just timing in the markets. So Toby's older, and I think his money is roughly around twelve hundred pounds. So not right. a bad return from two hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah, Jessica's three years later is worth 1800 pounds wow and toby's like how come (laughs) jessica's (laughs) is worth considerably more than mine and unfortunately for toby was born in 2005 so uh, we invested his just before the global financial crisis Uh, jessica was born in 2008 and her money got invested right at the bottom of the market Uh, that just shows about time in the market It, it it does it does now they both made excellent returns and i think toby quite 
secretly wants the market to crash after his has cashed in. So they end up with a level playing field. Right. But it's it's a good example for A, it's just showing them how quickly it can grow. And B, just <coughs> having that longer term view. Sure. Um, when we was in lockdown, um, I got everyone, including my wife, to do a little bit of a uh, stock competition. Right. I said, right, I'm going to invest £100 and you each got to pick a stock and whoever's one's gone up the most at the end of the year, uh, I will pay you the profit into your, into your bank account. Um, but then we're not going to sell them. We're going to see what happens after two years and after three years, just to show them it's that not just that one year, but that long term investing. Sure. And uh, that was good fun. It got them interested in the markets and, you know, I got them to give a discussion on why they were choosing those. Who did they choose out of interest? Um, Claire, my wife, went for Sainsbury's. OK. And that was doing go very well. You know. particularly go. go with what you know. Yeah. And when Morrison's got bid for, um, yeah. Sainsbury's got, got along with it. That was good. Toby went for... Um, he wanted to go Amazon, but I said, I'm afraid they're more than £100 a share, so you can't yeah. have Amazon. So he went for Nike, and his oh, reasoning yeah. was, um, we're in lockdown, the gyms have shut, more people are buying more leisure wear. Okay. I was like, I like that. Um, Jessica went for Apple, because okay. in her circle of life, everything's Apple. It's, yeah. it's your phone, it's your AirPods, it's, it's whatever. Um, I went for 3i, the... Um, Okay. Uh, FTSE 100 company. Uh, yeah. I've got a friend who works there and it sounds like an amazing firm. So I was like, I'd go for 3i. And um, I won? was leading pretty much throughout until um, Apple overtook me uh, with a week to go. So Jessica oh. won. Jessica won. They all made profit, which was amazing. And Jessica yeah. won. And we review it now to see how they've done now a year what a great way i think that's such an amazing lesson because my yeah, daughter just got them more interested yeah i can see and so my husband in lockdown prior to lockdown um he'd have we have savings and, and money and stuff and he was always like no i'm not going to stock market I, i'm going to keep the money in premium bonds um and i kept saying to him you've got such a brilliant mind the way your mind works he works at sort of director level mm. he understands how businesses work um you'd be great at uh, you know picking stocks and actually yeah you'd be bit rusty at first but I think once you get used to it you'll really appreciate it so in lockdown he went so is now a good time if I was going to do it should I do it now and I said dear yeah go go do it yes um and he's done amazing now obviously it's dropped was whilst we're recording this we've just come out of we've got um, obviously what's going on in Russia so at the yes. end of March we had I'm calling it an adjustment a, a sort of post-COVID January adjustment on the market so I'm not sure. So it depends on the, the the portfolio as to why the drops have happened, obviously, in January. Um, so it's not as as good. But I think he's put in somewhere like nine grand. And actually, in a normal market scenario, he would have easily doubled his money. So it's not mm. quite double now, but it's still made really good returns. Um, and when things hopefully when things do bounce back up after Russia's, you know, put his, uh, their toys back in the pram. Yes, it um, certainly muddied the waters. Yeah, then hopefully, then, you know, we're talking double the investment. So he's done incredibly well um, by picking certain stocks in certain areas. But getting my daughter to understand it, she has such a mindset of, um, I need some money for Saturday. Can I um, have some money, please? And I say, well, you know, you did have some money last week. OK, but I, I want to go with my friends this week. And then I say okay, well, you need to do some jobs and you know, mm. give her a list of jobs. And she'd be like, reluctantly just about do <laughs> them. And then she'd have enough money. And then I say to her, why don't you do some money next week? So in two or three weeks time, when you go to your friends again, you've got the money, save the money for some, no, why don't I bother doing that? I'll just do it when I need to do it. It's like very reactionary off the cuff. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a generational thing. I think yeah. it's, it's, it's getting that mindset of harvesting now. Yeah. So you've got, something something later on the and later on, yeah. yeah but I think that does come down to like so my little boy who's five we started with little jam jars um and he has a give he has pocket money so much goes into the give jar which is you know he, he can give to charity if he wishes he recently did that to you Ukraine um uh the that's brilliant Red, Red Cross yeah go, go for some money to that and then um 10 percent uh, not 10 percent another uh, third of it it goes into his play jar and then the other part is on his so it's play, give and save. 
and so a young but his mindset is very different to hers they're like chalk and cheese so he's very logical very um energetically you know, in his personality mm. he's very logical very thought out very linear whereas my daughter her energy is much more happy go lucky uh, much more um you know structures rubbish that's really boring and it did it does make me wonder if that's why you have so many women that just aren't on that sort of ideal of structuring and that money can be boring and that's where some of it comes into it but I love the idea that you've suggested with getting her to buy a, a share in yeah. a company that she likes um because yeah I'm so I'm going to try that thank you so much for sharing that because I do actually think it might it's help fine her. and this year's stock picks have been very different as well so Jessica went for Disney right because um during lockdown Disney plus was added to the uh, to yeah. the household bills and she loves marvel and everything else like that so it, we've we've got our money's worth there um toby went for sonos so the um uh, speakers and they oh, do okay. all the the posh speakers and stuff um they pay a really reasonably good dividend so um he's due his first dividend payment out of that one so that'll be interesting to see the effect the effect on that one um gosh what did claire go for Claire went for BP. Really? Um, yeah, purely because um, I remember going at dinner one time, one time we were talking about ethical and everything else and the best ethical companies. And I sort of just, I, I do like to mix it up a little bit just to be a bit devil's advocate. Yeah. I said, well, I think BP is a pretty good ethical company. And but my kids were like, you're, you're joking. How? They How? Yeah. oil energy. And I said, yes, but. You know, if you look in, if you look in the rear view mirror, one hundred percent, there's no way you'd buy BP because of its its history. Yeah. However, looking in the through the windscreen and the road yeah. ahead of you, yeah. you could argue that BP have got an amazing infrastructure. They've yeah. got some amazing engineers, and they've definitely got the the desire to actually be one of the key renewable energy companies, companies in yeah. the world. I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah. So um, that that's obviously hit home, and she's done pretty well with the. With the oil price at the moment and i went for um general motors okay because um all the limelight at the moment is taken by tesla for the electric vehicles but vw vw is my second choice and uh, general motors uh, a bit like bp in a way you might look at them and go oh big gas guzzling cars but their their rollout and they've got the dealership in place to to be able to sell a lot more vehicles and get a lot more vehicles in people's homes uh, than someone like Tesla. Great. So yeah. that that was the reason there. And it's not just, I know we pick a new stock every year, but <coughs> excuse me, these stocks are for five years. Yeah. So sometimes so, the themes play out quickly, sometimes they don't. No, exactly. And today's show, and I, I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take it possibly in a not as different tangent, but was all around avoiding temptation for a better long term investing. Mm. And what you've just described is, OK, what's in the vision? What what can we see in the future? And you've mentioned ethical being part of that, but it doesn't always have to. It's obviously down to people's preferences. Mm. But there is um, people that are picking those like your wife. You know, she's made money from oil at the moment, but long term, she sees it as um, you know a good company to invest yeah. in in the future. And we talked very briefly about um, the fact that your daughter's shares were worth more, even though they've been running for a less amount of time, because the time of timing the market. So the yes. saying goes, and everybody knows this is in financial services, or you listen to these kind of podcasts, but a lot of my audience are very new to investing or money management or wealth creation or any of those things. Um, so they might not know the, the saying that it's not about timing the markets, as in when's the best time to invest. It's about time in the market. So actually yeah. the longevity. But you gave a very good example where you can time it wrong. Um, and who knows, for example, we're in Russia, right? You know, the situation with Russia right now, we don't know if that's next week or next month, but I think you'd be definitely better Absolutely. investing at some time in this period now than you yeah. were on the 1st of January. Yeah, we've done, um, obviously running the portfolios and the, and the funds is obviously our key element, but part, you know, half of the job is to make sure we can create clear narratives and, and explain what we're doing to clients. Otherwise, there's, there's really no point in doing what we're doing. 
And I've done a lot of work on using our own data because we've been running portfolios now nearly 18 years. And is there any lessons we can learn from that? And Rebecca, you're spot on. You know, this, this um, uh, mindset of being comfortable with the ups and downs to, to tame fear and greed is, is really critical. And, you know, we, we've shown the longer you stay invested for, the probability of you getting a better return massively increases. So if you take a five-year period, that's, that's amazing. If you take a 10-year period, my gosh, you, you, you can't underestimate the, the growth potential in that because we've all heard the stories and I, I know these off by heart. So if you'd invested in the FTSE All Share, so that's the top 350 companies in the UK from February 98 to February 2018, so a 20-year period. And it's a good one because it takes out COVID so yeah. you don't get that skew of COVID. Yeah. Um, if you invested ten thousand pounds, that would have grown to thirty one thousand one hundred and fifty pounds. Wow. Yeah. And that's uh, you're taking into account uh, the dot com crash. You're taking into account the global financial crisis. The journey you've taken, you would have been going through fear and greed quite a few number of times. But yeah, if you'd have just stayed in, invested in, in. three times, if you missed the best ten days, that return halved. Wow. When was the best 10 days? Um, They were, there was three around the dot-com crash. Right. And there was, the rest were around um, the global financial crisis. Right. Area. So if you tried to time the markets by nipping in and out, because it's a bit risky, I'll take it into cash, then I'll go back in. If you happened to miss those best 10 days, you would have wiped out uh, 50% of your potential return. You still made money. You still made 15. You know, you went from 10 to 15. How many days before you made a loss? Oh, gosh. I'm going to guess a, f- as a spitball five. It's an extra 15. Tw- if you miss 25 days, the best 25 right. days you made a loss. Wow. And if you think about that 20-year journey, that's yeah. less than 1% of your journey. Yeah, so how can you, you can't time that. You can't time markets. You can't With, time markets. You can't. It's it, there is a little bit of luck in that, don't you think? Yeah. It, 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 that, that, I think that's as simple as that. And I remember a conversation I had with you in. I'm trying. I, I almost feel like 2020 didn't happen, or 2021 didn't happen. Yeah. It's almost like such a blur. So I have to really think about when I spoke to you. But it was in the April um, when the crash was happening um, yes. around the investment portfolio. So at that time, um, I think I had three or four million. I think at the time yeah. of you guys. Um, and we're talking uncharted waters, right? Yeah, we're talking, no one knows. No yeah. one knows. And I said to you, well, I've got some clients who are really, really nervous. What, what, are, we, what are you doing about it? <laughs> and you said, nothing. Um, and I said, well, should I de-risk them? Should I bring them down in a risk profile? And compliance will say what they, they have opinions on this. And if you've got a client that's maybe five years off retirement, you might need to make some different decisions. But generally speaking, you, you stay the course. And I had clients coming to me with new money going, I'm really nervous. Like, should I really be investing this money? And I said, look, I can only tell you what I'm telling my existing clients, which is to stick. And actually, you're better investing now than, than what you were yeah. two or three months ago. So you, you, once it does bounce back up, and oh, my God, the returns that those clients got, they were so thankful that, of that advice. And they did amazingly well that year. And then recently we had the drops and thankfully I haven't had many 10% notifications. So for people's information, if we have portfolios that drop below 10% as so they're, they're losing more than 10%, then we have to make a notification to the client. And thankfully I've literally only got a very small handful and all of those are in nine or 10 risk profiles. So the highest yeah. risk profile. Um, I don't think any of them are yours, by the way, I will say. Good. <laughs> um, and um so I was looking around for information around what was going on with Russia. How do I sort of explain all of this to my clients? And I did, I did a blog on it on my Evolution Financial Planning website. So if you want to go and check out the source, you can do. And it was a blog around the markets. And there was this particular company that did a hundred year history of the bull and the bear markets around what's, what's been going on. And every single time there was quite a big dramatic drop, World War II, the recessions, etc. cetera. Um, there was also a very dramatic uprise. And I'm not talking, it looked like within, I don't know, a month, 
it maybe it was maybe slightly 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 over that month but on the graph of a 100 year graph it looked like that second it, looked, it just peaked yes. straight away and i think we we saw quite a gradual increase after the pandemic didn't we uh, but there were some massive peaks in that period of time as well yeah you're right it's um you know and there's some of the studies we've been doing it's you know a bit like you're saying some clients might not have known the adage time in the markets not to try and to time the markets the other one as well is the reason why we have fear and greed and the emotions and you know we can make poor decisions at the top when greed gets too dominant and at the bottom when fear gets too dominant is emotionally the pain of a loss we feel two and a half times more than the gain mm -hmm. so we we put too much emphasis and weight on the gain and that's where we can make bad decisions and when we do recover it never quite feels the same. We remember the loss more than the gain. And ironically, in that example you've, you've talked about, Rebecca, the, the gain tends to last two and a half times longer than the downturn you had. So again, it's just remembering over a 30-year investment journey, you're going to probably have three or four significant downturns, yeah. but they've all had recoveries. And you're going to have more up periods and you are down periods. Yeah. So it's, <coughs> excuse me, it's, it's just trying to remember that. And we mapped out this emotional journey. And you're right, where we are at this moment in time now, people are feeling fear and capitulation and depression. Uh, but ironically, this time, these elements, this is the time of financial, maximum financial opportunity. Mm. When you're buoyant and, um, um ebullient and ecstatic that's the time for financial maximum risk so right. you know investing now even though it seems counterintuitive to a lot of investors you know a bit like my daughter jessica when she's investing at the bottom of the global financial crisis i remember reading articles of you'll never buy a stock again in your life well you know 15 years oh, later they do make some rubbish up don't they they do they do <laughs> and the other study we showed was um Yes, stay invested 100%. But if you're in cash now, does it matter when you invest? And the answer was yes and no. If, you're, if you've got a really short time horizon, if you're only going to invest in for a year, wow, when you invest masses, matters massively, absolutely yeah. massively. But if you're going to invest for, say, 10 years, when yeah. you start really doesn't matter. Because yeah, it, and, and it, I'd never it want works time out it. average. No, I'd, absolutely. I'd never want to time it. And I say that to clients now that are investing right now. I don't know whether you put in this 10, 20, 30, 100 grand more, um, reviewing pensions, whatever it is I'm doing. Like Sometimes we're talking hundreds of thousands of pounds. I don't know if it's now or next week or next month. I, I don't know, even in normal circumstances, because mm. there's, there's, there's never any normality in the stock market. No, no, you're right. And we can, uh, you know, we both know there's a... <coughs> excuse me you can write a list for every calendar year of the reasons not to be invested yeah um 2016 donald trump gets into power um it looks like there might be a nuclear war with north korea and there's a trade war with china my gosh why would you want to be invested then right 2016 was a good year 2017 was an amazing year so there's always reasons not to be not invested to. and, it, and, it, and yeah. it levels out i mean obviously there is risk yeah. involved and you should um, you know, make sure you're taking the right kind of risk with your investing. Um, and like, would you like to explain the difference to people with what you do and the difference what what you're doing with your kids? So obviously you're yes. picking shares individually, um, which is not a bad thing to do. And I would like to come back to that as maybe a, yep. a concept for some people to consider. Um, but what does that differ from what you do as a portfolio manager? Because I think that's what I think when people come to me, they some some people think that's what I do, like I pick shares, and I and I don't. No financial advisor, independent financial advisor, does. There are very very few now that might be old school, and they may pick funds. Um, so, but what I mean by that is like a FTSE 100, and then they might uh, build in a portfolio where they then build in a bond, and maybe some property funds, etc. Very little financial advisors do that. We tend to use people like Shane to en enable that because they're the experts at it and we often our time is taken up speaking to clients and dealing with compl um, compliance um so would you like to explain the difference between picking the share and building a portfolio in the not the simplest way but in a 
no non-jargon way okay i will do my best because i do i do tend to drift into jargon sometimes you'll have to you have to tell me off if i do i try um, i might not spot them but i'll try <laughs> picking the shares is if you're picking an individual share that is probably the um the ultimate risk and reward trade-off because it's a binary outcome that share that you buy in um gosh um bmw um is BP. either going to go up or going to go down or bp is either going to go up or it's going to go down at the time you you purchase <laughs> excuse me purchase right. that share um what i do as a as a portfolio manager is i want a basket of lots of shares within lots of funds so i'm not relying on bp going up all the time i i have a diversified a mix a blend of different things doing different things at different times now they're probably the easiest way to think about it is i have two ingredients i have flour and i have sugar and depending on how sweet your tooth is how much risk you want to take mm -hmm. depends how much sugar i put in and depends how much flour i got in and when i'm looking at the sugar it's not just one fund providing me that sugar i've got seven or eight different funds from different regions so i've got a uh, I've got a UK sugar fund and I've got a uh, European sugar fund and an American sugar fund. And those individual sugars taste a little bit different. And conversely with the flour, that's like bonds. That could be uh, infrastructure, you know, things that can behave very differently to individual shares. And when you put them all together, you end up with a lovely blend where you're not wholly reliant on BP going up mm -hmm. and you're spreading your risk. And we're probably portfolio manager. Probability manager is probably sort of a more accurate definition of that of that initials. And you know, we're looking at over the long term, what are the best areas on a probability for us to take make money? So we look at the UK, Europe, US, Japan, emerging markets, and then we decide how much, based on someone's level of risk, are we going to put into those areas. And, and, that's, and what's that's important probably with it. that is that if I was talking to Raw London, Raw London would have their Raw London funds and yeah. they'd be building their own fund. Whereas you're bringing in a BlackRock, a Royal London, a UBS, a Vanguard, yeah. and you are building a portfolio of other collective funds. Yes, I'm bringing together the, the best of the best. To, to create a really well diversified and good returning portfolio. So, you know, um, Vanguard, fantastic UK tracking product. Okay, I'm gonna add that to my portfolio. Uh, BlackRock, they have a really good continental European fund. Great, I'm gonna add that into my portfolio. UBS, have a really good US fund. They invest in medium sized companies. So not your large Facebooks, Amazons, Netflix, the medium sized companies, which are gonna be the growth area. I'm going to put that into my portfolio. It's taking the best of everyone yeah. to create that, that portfolio. And when one of those funds aren't working, so let's say Vanguard isn't particularly working, uh, we look at our reserve list and go, is there a better fund on our reserve list? Great, we'll swap them over. Sure. And so just to explain to people um, those examples that I gave was Black Vanguard and BlackRock and Royal London, they work for those particular companies. So the fund managers work for that company. Um, they're building that portfolio based on that company's board level agreed strategies as to what should be in those particular funds. And they could have hundreds of different funds, some of the firms, some don't, but some they could have hundreds of different port, uh, funds that are available. Um, some of them, uh, you, usually you, you some of them have like what I call it a multi-asset fund. So I need to explain that to people. So I could, for example, go to Royal London and choose a multi-asset fund from them directly. So they already have property. They already have bonds. They already have um, a different asset classes within that fund. But what you're doing, Charlotte, and you can tell me if I'm wrong here, is that you wouldn't necessarily include that multi-asset fund. You would actually go with their individual and build that kind of asset class yeah. yourself as a yeah. portfolio manager. Yeah, we're looking for the individual ingredients where Royal London can produce that ready meal, as yeah. it were. Uh, we're looking to create the meal from scratch so we know, how, you know, we, so we know each ingredient is the best. So sure. Royal London, 
very good on equities, very good on fixed income, might not be particularly as good as someone else for property. So we yes. bring in a different company to cool. run run the property element. Yeah, got it. Well, so what I was the reason I was going down that road was to explain and, and it, I'll be honest, some people might have switched off or they might have stopped listening. Right. Because and if you haven't, I'd love to know that you've got this. So um, because it's, this is where people go, oh, my God, this is like going over my head. This is like, it's like someone, I don't know, a doctor talking to me about different cancer treatment or different mm. kinds of cancer. I, I don't understand that. Um, and there's lots of other subjects that I don't understand. Um, that's just one that popped into my head. Um, but it's, it, it does go over your head and it feels overwhelming and it feels, you know, well, what, how's this relevant for me? So if you're going to build your own portfolio, if you're going to go and um, pick a particular fund or you're going to go to a particular company and choose their ready made meal of funds, um, you might not be ready for any of that, right? You, you might you might want to um, use a financial advisor, but you might not feel that you're even ready for that. You're at a point where you just want to give, you just want to understand it a little bit better. And that is why I love your idea about what you did with the kids. Yeah. Because I think that's a great way to just pick a stock, pick a stock in a company that you know, never invest money you can afford, you can't afford to lose. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, so if you are going to buy a share and I don't know, it's five pounds a share and you've got 50 quid spare, then go ahead and buy X amount of shares for that particular company. Um, but see, it as a long term investment. Right, Shane. It's like, OK, yes. so don't think, OK, well, it's it's peaked. Cash it in. And, and this brings up to my other prop. My other question is that. If someone has got a portfolio and they are managing it themselves, this is something that I don't have to think about because i do what i do so it's a bit of a might be a silly question how do when do they know let's say it's a five-year period yeah they, they won't will they they're just gonna have no. to hopefully guess that that's the best time to cash in yeah it's it's it is very difficult it is very difficult i think if you're investing for a particular thing so uh university fees you know, right. Rebecca, we're going to have to think about university fees, not before long. Um, you know, you start investing, you know, five years out and then, you know, you've got an end end point where you want to invest in there. It's, or it's you just might, a case of having to deal with it. Yeah. Or you might have uh, a number. I need to grow it to £20,000. And once it reaches £20,000, fantastic. You might you might be enjoying it so much it goes to twenty five. So you take out the 20. Yeah, that's done. And then you're playing with. Uh, investing with money that's effectively free yeah because you've you what know you've already those, done your generation what about those that don't have a timeline or don't mm. have a, a value of amount um but they are going with a strategy of dividend income and they yes. want to receive a certain amount of income yeah yeah um it's tricky and it, it as you were talking about it just reminded me of a quote from um one of the fund managers that we'd been invested in since we launched the portfolios back in 2004 and it was Tom Diggenden at UBS. And he said, um, we're in a race that has no finish line. And I think if you conceptually think about that, it's like, okay, so there's, there's never a point where I get to stop and rest. It's, it's got no finish lines. You just have to mentally prepare for that. And there'll be times when your portfolio's down or the market's not in the right place and you just have to hunker down and, and push through. And I think, a lot of clients now, Rebecca, as well, it's, you know, with the changes to pensions and, you know, ha not having to buy an annuity, it used to be get to age 65, mm -hmm. buy my annuity. That's my, that's my um, time frame finished. Now it could be, well, actually, I don't have a time frame because I'm still going to be, be invested beyond age 65. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I'd like my um, beneficiaries to, to, you know, inherit some of this money as well so there's no yeah. point for me going into cash because they're going to in, you know in, in, inherit the portfolio and then they'll have a 50 year time horizon and then they'll have another 50 year time horizon so i think you've picked on a really interesting area there where yeah to, to get the head around of look this isn't about five years no it is so. about long term yeah. um and for some people there might be a number and gosh you know miles better than I do you know the cash flow modeling and you're working out you know clients in financial goals and you know there'll be a number that says once you reach there mm. whatever happens you're not going to run out of money no, but and I think, I think that's a massive thing 
No, totally. And but I think it's a really interesting subject. And the reason why it made me think of this subject today is my husband said to me the other day, so my our investment, that portfolio that he'd created, yeah. he said, um, the goal is to have this many shares providing this much dividend that would then give us X amount of income per year, as well as our pensions, as well as mortgage being cleared, as well as other investments. And he and basically it's all in ISAs. So those that don't know, you don't That's pay it. any... Yeah. Yeah, you don't pay. You'd hope to think he got good financial advice, right? Um, <laughs> I hope so. Um, that he won't, he won't pay any income tax on that money, whereas you do with pensions. Um, yep. Although there are pros and cons to both, so don't take that as advice for the being right for yourselves, those that are listening. Um, yeah, so he can have an income from that portfolio. So I, I, I've always looked at growth, right? So I've always been like, you're either in accumulation stage or you're in income phase, right? Yeah. But I have a huge amount of people that come to me and even in, I've got a free Facebook group with 1200 people in it. And I did a poll the other day. It's, it's been dormant for the last eight months. I've re reignited it. And I asked the question in a poll, like, what do you want the most help with? And basically they were describing portfolio income from mm. wealth strategies either with their business or wealth creation strategies, which provide portfolio income. And an easy example of that is buying a property and renting it out. Yes. So that, but that, so that's what they're looking for. So when my husband started saying, you know, he's focused his portfolio towards dividend yields, which is very different from growth, right? Mm. Yeah, it's that, you know, you, you get growth is the sexy side of the, of the um, investing because you know that's where you end up doubling your money really quickly and and the, the and the stocks you're buying tend to be you know the you know teslas and all the exciting stuff um dividend yields come from those mature companies mm. um that have you know procter and gamble unilever yeah big conglomerates there's no way they're going to grow their bottom line by 20 percent year on year they're they're huge but what they do they still generate a lot of cash Mm. And that cash generation has to be paid out to the shareholders. Yeah. So you get a, you know, you get a, a dividend yield coming back to you. And yeah, it's a really good strategy. If you can get to a certain amount of share value, yeah. then you can sort of roughly know how much yield that's going to generate for you year on year on. And if you can say, okay, um, we've got outgoings of X yeah. and my investments have, out, have a dividend yield of Y, yeah, and if they equal each other, well, wow, it's, it's it's a self fulfilling investment for you then, and but ideally you think, as well. Go on. So go on. No, go on. Go on. I'd say ideally as well. You know, Unilever will be paying you this income. Um, yeah. It doesn't mean the share price stays static. No. You know, over a long period of time, that share price appreciates as well, and yeah. eventually their um, dividends they pay out look to increase as well. So you you're not saying okay, I'm receiving four percent this year. Where it might end up being 4.8 percent five yeah. years down the line you're like that's fantastic but in your portfolios that you have they you you could still have those companies within that still providing a dividend right yes absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so and in which case if a client then came to me and says well i need some income now you could have some of that income and potentially some of the growth as well yeah if it, as long as it doesn't run out make your money run out too quickly and you're not drawing into the capital um, no exactly yeah. And that's where you can do cash flow projections. Yeah. Um, super interesting conversation, Steve. And uh, sorry, Steve, Sh Shane. <laughs> so, uh, the reason why I said Steve is because um, someone in my team has titled that your podcast on my my project management tool as Steve. And and I know that's not your name. I've known you hey, for years. I, I can be a Steve. It's not a problem. <laughs> You're definitely not. I don't think you look like or feel like a Steve. I don't know why. But... Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> offense to any steves out there but, um so today's talk we were going to be talking about avoiding temptation for longer term investing and we've talked massively around long-term investing not time in the markets the kind of different ways that you can build a portfolio and how you do that at your firm so would you like to tell us a little bit more about you as in the firm not you personally yeah um and where the philosophy behind that brand name come from i'm really intrigued by um yeah so you could tell us a little bit about you yeah no absolutely so um we are called you asset management uh, we've had a few names along the way uh, one of the main reasons for the name change first 
because we are part of the Beaufort Group. And the Beaufort Group has a advisory network uh, called Beaufort Financial. And we have the investment arm called Beaufort Investment. And we also have a lot of um, clients, such as yourself, Rebecca, that aren't part of the group because, you know, as a standalone investment arm, I think we, we are very competitive in the marketplace. So you don't necessarily have to be a Beaufort Financial Beaufort. Advisor. No. Yeah. Um, but what we were coming across was not barriers to using us, but there was always a raised eyebrow. Also, how close is your link with the financial yeah. side? And it's they're completely different companies. We just share very similar names. Yeah. So in order to sort of nip that in the bud, um, our CEO decided that we're going to go through a rebrand. And he wanted that, you know, sort of an easily understood, simple name that resonated what's at the heart of our proposition. Yeah. And he sort of gave, you know, like Amazon, Apple, Google, sim simple words, names that easily remember. Um, and he came up with you. And it was a it's case about of you, isn't it? Not as in absolutely. You, people it's that about are listening, the it's client. about you. Yeah. Yeah. And everything we do is centered around you, the client. And our ethos is whether we're developing new products, whether we're thinking about making changes to the asset allocation. Uh, or some of the fun changes underneath, the way we write our quarterly reviews or fact sheets, we all think about the client outcome. How can we make this the best client outcome possible? And for the last 18 years that we've been doing this, um, putting the client first has meant we're in excellent shape for the future. I think if you put the client first, then you're not going to go far wrong. And I think yeah, that's I that's totally, one of the keys. I, yeah, I totally agree. That's why I started my business and why I had to start my business because I, I wanted to start putting the client first and yeah. uh, I, where I was, they weren't willing to do that. Um, so I, I love the ethos. So what's next for you? So for us, um, for, us for you, it's um, <laughs> we're, we're looking to uh, acquire some firms sometime in the future to wow. increase our, our asset base, which is which is excellent. Um, we're looking to maybe launch some new products somewhere down the line. So we have our active range and we have our passive range and we have mm -hmm. our ethical range. Yep. Um, nearly three years ago now, we launched our unitized funds, which is a blend of both active and passive. We have a balanced and a growth version of that. Um, I think the current, you know, with COVID and also with obviously the issues we have with Russia, um, the cautious end is becoming more popular and a lot of what we do is driven by demand from our clients so we're looking to launch a cautious product uh, to bring that as a whole suite on there um, how do you do that when the returns aren't quite there at the moment it is tricky it is tricky you have to be um really cute on costs so we're running uh, nearly a billion and a half of assets now so we've got economies of scale where we can go to blackrock go to royal london and say Yes, I know that's the sticker price that everyone's buying it for. However, um, we're going to give you X amount of money. Um, can yeah. we have a, a rebate, a discount on that price? And that goes straight to the client. So particularly with the cautious funds, we need to be really cost conscious. They need to cosh, be very, very cost lean. conscious. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, it's, you know, for us cautious clients, they tend to get sort of the, the best, the, the worst of both ends. Mm. They tend to sort of get hurt when everyone else is getting hurt. But because yeah. they don't have the equity content, they don't tend to get the return. So, you know, we've done a lot of work on different products. Um, there's sort of commodity products, infrastructure products, um, different absolute return products. Some that will complement the typical bond areas. Um, we invest in China bond at the moment, oh, which is okay. gives you a very different return profile to um, UK. UK or European or US bonds. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just it's looking um, looking a bit harder. Yeah. looking under areas that probably wouldn't have considered looking before yeah but yeah it's it's going to be very lean very lean that product and any of your portfolios have rush, rushing investments out of interest good question um uh when was it not was a like leading begin, question no 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 beginning of march um obviously you know sanctions are coming in and our regulator needs to know what exposures we have we had um less than half a percent exposure to russia yeah and i'm uh, generally within, finding that's the case of course yeah 
within 48 hours, um, the equity managers had sold theirs. <laughs> um, and the bond managers, um, they didn't necessarily have Russian bonds. They had a couple of US companies that generated some revenue from Russia. But that was deemed um, not the major part of their portfolio. So they've, they've retained those. Yeah. Amazing conversation. Um, and I'd love to hear from those that are listening your thoughts on today's show. And um, thank you so much, Shane, not Steve, um, for joining <laughs> for joining me. And um, wealth of knowledge. And I really appreciate you spending the time with me today. Is it's there been anything an you'd like absolute to, pleasure. Anything to share with our listeners before you go? Um, gosh, I think you mentioned it right at the beginning of the, of the conversation, Rebecca. It's, you know, if anyone's out there not sure about should they start investing i'd say start and just because we have rampant inflation and a war going on in europe do not let that be a impediment to you starting your investment journey definitely and if you have to start somewhere just buy a stock in a company that you already know and like yeah no invest in what you know yeah, yeah. and don't invest any money you can't afford to lose yeah. Just, just being sensible <laughs> put that in there thank you again Shane lovely to see you and um, go and check out um, the any information around you asset management via the links below and I hope to hear and see you on another show thanks again Shane pleasure thank you Rebecca bye-bye bye-bye